first let's focus on substitution reactions that take place at the anomeric carbon. That's carbon one, and keep in mind this is the carbon bearing two bonds to oxygen in the cyclic form of the monosaccharide. So it's the carbon I'm highlighting in green in this reactant. When we treat a monosaccharide like this with an acid catalyst and a nucleophile such as an alcohol, a substitution reaction takes place at the anomeric carbon and only at the anomeric carbon. We'll explain this fact when we look at the mechanism here in a second. Note though that what's happened here is the substitution of water which departed as a leaving group for an alcohol which comes in as a nucleophile. Because essentially what we're doing is exchanging one nucleophile, water on the product side, for another, the alcohol that appears on the reactant side, this is an example of nucleophilic substitution. And the mechanism is absolutely nothing more than a glorified SN1 reaction. It's acid catalyzed SN1. Let's draw some curved arrows and intermediates to see what we mean by that. In the first step, the anomeric hydroxyl group is protonated by the acid. While it's possible for all the other hydroxyl groups to be protonated, only the anomeric hydroxyl can depart with a pair of electrons to form a resonance stabilized cation. We can draw that departure as a D sub N step with just the CO plus bond breaking towards oxygen or as a beta elimination with the adjacent oxygen involved. And I like involving that adjacent oxygen to show that the positive charge in the resulting intermediate is delocalized over carbon and oxygen. So we'll draw the O plus resonance form with an octet on every atom, but keep in mind there's an alternative C plus resonance form for this. This resonance stabilized cation looks a lot like a protonated carbonyl compound, and it can undergo nucleophilic addition now by the alcohol, which is also a good nucleophile. And if we use a large excess of the alcohol, this will tend to be favored over the addition of water back to reform the starting material. That addition establishes a new CO bond, and deprotonation by the conjugate base of the catalyst generates the product that we see up here, which is now an acetal rather than a hemiacetal. And we can use this same reaction type to put a variety of nucleophiles at the anomeric carbon. Now, there are a few things to point out about this reaction. The first is that it's a glorified SN1 process. Notice that essentially what happens is we protonate the anomeric hydroxyl to turn it into a better leaving group. That leaving group then departs, and this is in essence a D sub N step. We could also call it beta elimination if we involve that adjacent oxygen, but the essence is cleavage of the CO bond. In the next step, we have the coordination of the nucleophilic oxygen to the carbonyl-like carbon, the anomeric carbon. And this looks a lot like an A sub N step. Again, with the extra arrow pushing the electrons onto oxygen, this could also be called AD sub N. It's also worth noting this resonance stabilized cationic intermediate. The two atoms that are sharing the positive charge are the carbonyl-like atoms within the ring, this O plus, and the carbon that's linked to it via a double bond. And this structure with carbon and oxygen linked to one another sharing positive charge is known as the oxocarbenium ion. It's really just a fancy way of saying an oxygen stabilized carbocation. But it's a common intermediate in reactions of carbohydrates like this. The resonance stabilization of the oxocarbenium ion helps explain why only the anomeric hydroxyl reacts. The only hydroxyl that can be protonated productively to produce a stable cation is the hydroxyl linked to carbon one, since this is the only carbon bearing a hydroxyl that is adjacent to another oxygen atom. Notice that at carbon five, we have a hydrogen, a CH2OH group, and another carbon linked to this oxygen. So there's no possibility of oxocarbenium ion formation at carbon five. Only at carbon one can we form a stabilized cation. If we think about this reaction from the nucleophile's perspective, it looks like we have put a sugar onto the nucleophile, and this is called glycosylation, and the resulting sugar-substituted nucleophile is called a glycoside. When the nucleophile is an alcohol, this is simply an acetal, and we can see the acetal functional group in the product, this carbon, the anomeric carbon, now linked to two alkoxy groups. However, other types of nucleophiles can come in here, so we can get, for example, aminals with a nitrogen here, and even sulfur-containing compounds with a sulfur atom linked to the anomeric carbon. Now, one of the nice things about acetal formation that we saw when we were introduced to it is that this reaction is reversible, meaning that we can get back the OH-containing hemiacetal or all the way back to the carbonyl compound 
just by treating with excess water and acid. And the mechanism here is in fact identical to the mechanism of glycoside formation or nucleophilic substitution at the anomeric carbon. In fact, this is a nucleophilic substitution. We're just changing the roles of the nucleophile and leaving group. Now the alcohol acts as a leaving group and water acts as the nucleophile. And to switch the roles, all we have to do is start with the acetal, start with the product of the previous slide and treat with a large excess solvent quantities of water and catalytic acid. Just to save a bit of time, I'll draw the mechanism out in abbreviated form, not including all the additional hydroxyl groups. The essence of the reaction happens at the anomeric carbon. And the first step is protonation of the alkoxy group now linked to the anomeric carbon. That protonation enables the loss of an alcohol as a leaving group through what we might call a D sub N or an E beta step to form an oxocarbidium ion. And now water, which is present in solvent quantities typically in these hydrolysis reactions, adds to the anomeric carbon. And after a final proton transfer to regenerate the acid catalyst, we get the neutral monosaccharide back. Notice again that this is, in essence, acid catalyzed SN1. There's a proton transfer event to establish a good leaving group. Then there is dissociation of a nucleophage, followed by association of a nucleophile. And as in the acetal formation that we saw on the last slide, we can think of this as a beta elimination enabled by the oxygen atom, followed by a nucleophilic addition to a polarized pi bond. And then there's a final proton transfer, and this generates the neutral product and regenerates the catalyst. This is an example of a hydrolysis reaction. Why is it called hydrolysis? Well, there's a bond that's breaking, the CO bond at the anomeric carbon, this bond I've highlighted in blue. And that bond cleavage is mediated or enabled by the nucleophilic addition of water to the starting material. And for that reason, this is called hydrolysis. Water, hydro, is causing the cleavage or lysis of a bond. I wanted to close this discussion of nucleophilic substitutions at the anomeric carbon with a look at some nucleophiles other than alcohols that can get involved in these reactions. So we've alluded to this fact that other types of nucleophiles can be involved, but haven't seen any specific examples. One of the most important examples involves glycosylation of the nitrogenous bases to form nucleosides, which are the building blocks of DNA and RNA. Three examples of nucleosides are shown for you here, and these consist of a sugar, a ribose or deoxyribose sugar. Here, ribose is shown, as well as a nitrogenous base, which is just an aromatic heterocycle containing one or more basic nitrogen atoms. That's where the nitrogenous base terminology comes from. Bases are nucleophilic, and so it's really no surprise that these aromatic heterocycles can act as nucleophiles toward the anomeric positions of the ribose sugar. Notice that where we find these key carbon-nitrogen bonds in all three of these nucleosides, the carbon involved is the anomeric carbon of the ribose. Notice that we have a bond to nitrogen and a bond to oxygen at all three of these key carbons within the nucleoside, and they're all the anomeric carbon of ribose. All of these nucleosides are formed through the reaction of a ribose sugar with a nucleophilic nitrogenous base molecule in a nucleophilic substitution reaction. And so, for example, when ribose and guanine come into contact inside the active site of an enzyme that catalyzes this process, what we get is the substitution of guanine, which I'll just abbreviate as HNR2, for water. Water is lost in all three of these reactions. And the same reaction type is happening in these other two examples as well. They're all about the potential of the anomeric carbon in ribose to act as an electrophile and undergo substitution reactions by the nucleophilic nitrogenous basis.